Hi, everybody. I'm MK Fain. And I'm Sasha White. And this is Identity Crisis. So today's episode is part one of a two-part series all about how to survive being canceled. MK and I have, you know, just a little bit of experience with that that we're going to talk about. So, um, but before we get into it, we are going to do our new segment, ICYMI, which stands for In Case You Missed It, where we give you one minute wrap ups of news stories that we thought were really important in the gender critical world. So MK, you will be giving us our first ICYMI today. Three, two, one, go. Last week, the Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. announced a change to the office's enforcement of prostitution laws, effectively implementing key aspects of the equality model, also known as the Nordic model in the borough. Vance asked the judge to dismiss over 900 open cases involving prostitution, as well as 5,000 cases of loitering for the purposes of prostitution. Uh, under the new policy, the district attorney, though, is going to continue to prosecute other crimes related to prostitution, such as buying sets, pipping, and sex trafficking. Uh, this is a big debate right now in New York City during especially a contested mayor's race where uh, we have people uh, in the front runners who are supporting full decriminalization. There are candidates supporting Nordic model and candidates supporting no decriminalization efforts at all. There are also two competing bills happening at a statewide level in New York implementing either the Nordic model or full decriminalization in New York State. We will be watching to see what New York State does, hoping they continue to protect women and girls by implementing the equality model. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question for you, MK. Um, I know this is a big question, but the Nordic model, what is the evidence of its effectiveness in the countries in Europe where it has been implemented? That is a great question. I'm glad you asked it because we actually have on 4W a whole article debunking myths about the Nordic model. And it really runs through some of the evidence around this. Um, specifically, though, uh, one of the things that really stands out in my mind as the strongest evidence is a Harvard Law Review article, which summarized the rates of sex trafficking in countries that implement the Nordic model uh, versus other countries. And that research is also in that article. So we should be sure to link that in the description. OK, great. So that will be. Um um, you'll be able to find that below in the description. And um, time for a second, I see why am I? Three, two, one, go. Callie Burt is an associate professor at Georgia State University in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. And this week, Callie has been the subject of cancellation herself when she was removed from her position on the editorial board of Feminist Criminology. This happened because she was accused of transphobia and anti-LGBTQ sentiment. This is obviously a familiar reason for cancellation, deplatforming, and having people removed from their positions. Um, Callie is a married lesbian woman, which is noteworthy because it shows once again the consistent persecutions of lesbians by these censorious gender ideologues. Um, to quote Callie from her Twitter, she wrote, if those labeling thought that I would meekly accept their slanderous characterizations of my work and character, they were wrong. So thank you, Callie, for standing strong. And for our viewers, I have an interview with Callie coming later this week. Great. I'm really looking forward On to Friday, that, Sasha. I'm so glad you're speaking to her. Yeah, it should be really interesting. Um, so that'll be coming out on Friday. OK, ready for our last I see why am I? All right, three, two, one. A new feminist anthology titled Spinning and Weaving Radical Feminism for the 21st Century is now available for purchase. The book is edited by radical feminist campaigner Elizabeth Miller, and the collection includes over 40 chapters by women from across the world, a whole diverse range of women on age, race, everything you can imagine. And they cover all issues impacting radical feminism today at really good deep dives. Contributing authors to this anthology include names you might recognize, such as Linda Bellos, Gail Dines, Sheila Jeffries, Janice Raymond, Dr. Jessica Taylor, a friend of the pod, Nina Paley, 4W editor, Dana Vitalisova, and yours truly, MK Fain. Um, this anthology is now available for purchase on the publisher's website or on Amazon. There will be a link in the description. And I really highly recommend checking out this book. Um, in addition to my own chapter, which covers technology and censorship online, uh, there's so many uh, brilliant, amazing women who contributed. So please check it out. Can't wait to read that, and especially your piece, MK. So I'm really excited. And you can find the links to everything below, as we said. 
So now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, today's episode is going to be very, a little bit emotional perhaps, but um, we wanted to talk about what it's like to be canceled and specifically how to survive cancellation. Yeah, so I really mentally kind of separate my uh, cancellation survival into kind of two parts. And I think those two parts are going to be how we end up of shaping up the two episodes that are going to make up uh, this two-part series. So for me, there was the immediate crisis of, oh my God, I just got fired and canceled. What do I do? And like responding to that immediate emergency of like securing my material, physical well-being. And then there's sort of the longer term process, which, you know, I think we're both, we would say we're still in the process of to some degree, although we've made major strides of building back stronger after this cancellation occurs. Um, so I guess I'll just start a little bit of background. We've talked about this on the show before, my story of getting canceled, but uh, I was canceled actually twice, but uh, the biggest one that happened really was when I got fired from my job. I was working as a software engineer at a Philly agency, and I had written a couple articles on Medium about gender critical feminism, including my article, Non-Binary is the New Not Like Other Girls, and it's deeply rooted in misogyny. That article, uh, someone at my workplace followed me on Medium and they saw the article and sent it to my employer with a complaint. Um, at least that's what I've pieced together has happened. And from there, the, I was pretty much immediately terminated. There was no discussion. Uh, they cited the article specifically in my firing letter saying that was the reason why. Um, I, my friends at my workplace who were kind of my closest friends at that point, um, because I had already been canceled from the animal rights movement where all my other friends previously had been, basically all bailed on me. I was uh, canceled from volunteer positions at local women's organizations I volunteered for. I was uh, deplatformed from two different conferences I was scheduled to speak at. I was kicked out of all of these like group chats and uh, uh, Slack groups and like pretty much the whole Philly tech or feminist communities like simultaneously just shunned me all at once. Um, and for me, that was really quite traumatic. Um, I knew that it was a possibility when I wrote the articles and I had prepared in advance financially. I was making really good money as a software engineer. It was, I had only been there for nine months, but it was the first time in my life I was really making uh, a significant salary, you know, with benefits and like all that good stuff. And so I was pretty aggressively saving my salary uh, with the knowledge that I might not be in this job forever. And so I had about three months of expenses saved up at the time. We were living really cheaply, which was really nice um, and allowed me to save those expenses ahead of time. And, uh, but when I was fired, it was still to some degree unexpected. I, didn't think it would happen so suddenly. I thought there would be some sort of warning. Um, I thought that, you know, the article would go viral and then I would get canceled, but it actually happened the other way around. I got fired before the article really even got very big. And then because I got fired, like then people started sharing it and then it kind of spiraled out from there. And it really all seemed to happen just because one person complained and then that just spread like wire, wildfire. And that aspect of it was really surprising to me. And I was also really surprised by all of the friends who ended up being very fair weather friends. Um, there were a couple women in particular, one who had even read and provided feedback on the article, helped me edit it, and who said that she agreed with most of the content, who ended up not only bailing on me and telling me that she, she didn't want to hang out with me anymore, but then she also ended up writing an article publicly trashing me and trying to distance herself from me because people knew that we were close. So that aspect of it, even though I had been through it before, even with another friends group, still it, it still continued to surprise me. Um, the individual people who ended up having no uh, having no integrity, honestly, and mm. so I. That was kind of what happened to me in the first place. And that was like my immediate crisis that I had to respond to. Do you remember the exact moment that you got fired? I mean, like, when did you yeah. get a call? Did you get an email? What was the... Oh, so, so this was like pre-COVID. So we had real offices back then that we worked in in person. <laughs> um, so I was sitting at... 
I know. I was sitting at a, a desk where I was working and um, the HR manager came up and said, uh, Mary Kate, can we please speak to you for a minute? And I kind of just had this like pit in my stomach. All, like I, you could tell, you know, and um, also there had been some other workplace stuff going on. A lot of people had been fired recently for laid off for other things. And so I kind of just could tell, all right, chopping block. Um, and so, you know, I was called into the office and they told me effective immediately, you are terminated because of this uh, article that you wrote and we are an inclusive workplace, therefore we cannot include you any longer. <laughs> and uh, I pushed back on them a little, just kind of to see what I could get them to say. Um, I remember I specifically asked them, oh, they said something along the lines of, I, I don't remember if they said they, the word concerned, but they said something along the lines of it would be damaging to them to continue to employ someone who had expressed uh, the sentiments of the article. And I said, and you're not concerned that it will look bad that you're firing a woman for writing about feminism, especially after you just laid off half of the female engineers at your company last week. And they said, no, we're not concerned. And I said, okay. And that was pretty much the end of it. You know, I got my stuff and I left and never spoke to most people in that workplace again. Um, they, oh, they, they offered me severance and to continue my health insurance, which I got through my job uh, an additional month if I signed an NDA in order to silence me and prevent me from talking about it. And I refused to sign the NDA, so I got no severance and my health insurance was immediately terminated. Um, and so to this day, they have been unable to silence me. So fuck you, prompt yeah. works. Fuck you, prompt works. <laughs> Get that on a bumper sticker. Yeah. <laughs> and did you like your job? How happy were you there? No, I, there were parts of it that I had liked certainly. Um, but one of the biggest parts that I liked were the other female engineers that I worked with and some of my, uh, some of my teammates I became quite close with. And there there were parts of it that I liked. Like I do actually like the part of web development and engineering that's creating something new out of nowhere and, and putting like this thing into the universe, like out of, you know, just letters and numbers on a computer that suddenly you've put, like created this whole thing. So I, I do like software engineering to some degree, but by the time I was fired, I was quite unhappy there because of these personnel problems that were happening where um, they were experiencing financial difficulties. And so they had laid off um, pretty much most of my friends already. And I was one of two female engineers left there at the time on a staff of what was like 40. And uh, it, by the time I was fired, I was honestly ready to quit anyways. So there was a, a big part of me that was relieved, but I was not, I was on, I was more hurt about all of the people who I lost that way rather than losing the job itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I should tell my story now too. Yeah. So I know yours was quite different because you weren't expecting this to happen. So how did that play out? Yeah. Well, so yeah, our stories have some big differences and some big similarities too. So I, yeah, I was not expecting this. This was the most out of the blue thing that could have ever happened. Um, but well, in a way it wasn't, but let me get into that. So um, after I graduated college at the end of 2019, I decided to try my hand in the publishing industry because I graduated with a degree in Russian literature and it's obviously a very lucrative, useful degree. Um, so, you know, instead of going to grad school and um, trying to find a career in academia, I decided why don't I just do some internships in the publishing industry, it's sort of like, instead of grad school, then I don't have to go into debt and um, maybe I'll be able to get a job at the end of it. So, and a career is what I was thinking. So I did that and I did get hired at this agency that I was interning at, it was remote. And, um, you know, it was kind of like, a dream come true because I, you know, interning for, for months in the publishing industry, it wasn't that great. I didn't really get to do the interesting stuff. Um, it was kind of like, oh, is this really what I want to do? But when I got hired as, as an assistant agent, it was really exciting. It was like the beginning of a new career. Potentially, I was thinking these are all the, you know, I can use my the skills that I have, the passions that I have 
basically the job is you get manuscript submissions from hopeful authors and you choose the ones you think have potential and you work with them and sign them and get their books published. So, um, you know, I jumped right into this. I just started giving it my all. I had this job for one month and I had even signed my first client before I got fired. I was really working hard and I was really sort of excited to build this career. Um, now on the side, I was a huge turf, right? So <laughs> that was very important to me and had been for some years. Um, and I've told you know that story already, but it was it was really important to me to talk about it because it was forbidden to talk about. And um, and I had just discovered Twitter very ironically because my boss who ended up firing me recommended that I use Twitter for publishing. <laughs> and um, you know, at, so at his recommendation, I I got on Twitter, I checked it out. Um, I think I had an old account that I had made a few years ago, so I sort of revitalized it, made it my professional account. And then one day on Twitter, I saw one turf. Her name was actually um, Eva Karilova. I don't know if she's still on Twitter, but anyway, she was my first Twitter turf. And then from her, I realized that there were like hundreds and thousands of turfs on Twitter. It was so excited. By the way, I'm saying turf, obviously, I mean gender critical people. Turf is obviously a slur. Um, so, well, okay, that's debatable. It's not a slur like some other slurs. I don't wanna overstate that, but- um, We're reclaiming it. Yeah, we could reclaim it. So I got really excited by this. I start. I made a, a different account that was anonymous at first to talk with all the other gender crits on Twitter. And then, you know, JK Rowling came out with her thing. It was such an exciting time in our movement. And I ended up deciding to de-anonymize, de yeah, to make my account not anonymous anymore. Put my face, put my name, first and last name, and just kept tweeting. So now I have two accounts, right? I have my professional account and it says where I work. And I did have a few sort of turfy things there. I did retweet the JK Rowling article. Um, but I didn't really, I kept it very just business-like over there on my, you know, turf account, full turf. So um, one day, a Sunday, I got an email from my boss and it was just a link to a tweet. And all he wrote was something, you know, what is going on here? What is this? And I click the link and the tweet is some anonymous person I think uh I didn't to me they were anonymous I think they were a known entity in the publishing world but on Twitter they were anonymous and they were saying uh Sasha White is a vile transphobe stay away from her if you're in the industry um and they tagged you know my boss and both of my Twitter accounts so when I click this and I see that people are starting to pile on and it's the first time I ever opened Twitter and saw like 20 plus notifications and it was absolutely terrifying. I'm just seeing people, you know, going off, look at this person, she's so, such a bigot, boot her out of the industry. Um, you know, she's not even trying to hide it. Look, she even said something about JK Rowling on her main account, my crimes, you know, my many crimes. So um, that's just starting to happen. But this one tweet was the cause of it all. So I email back my boss and say, you know, I'm horrified to see this. Twitter can be so toxic. Can we talk about this? He emails me back with, I think it was like half an hour after his first email. And he goes, um, no, it's way past that. We have to part ways now after scrolling through your Twitter. And that was that was that. I mean, nothing ever changed after that. I tried to call him. He didn't answer. I left him a voicemail and, um, you know, just saying, like, why are you doing this? And this is because I have a different definition of the word woman. I might not say the same thing today, but I was very emotional and panicking, just absolute panic. As more and more people started noticing what was happening, the situation started to escalate. My boss, I guess, felt the need to put a statement out. And so he wrote on Twitter, the official, our official statement regarding former assistant agent, Sasha White. 
Tonight, we were made aware of comments made by Sasha on her professional and secondary Twitter accounts. We do not have any room for anti-trans sentiment at TLA, that's the agency, period. Thus, we have parted ways with Sasha. In honor of the trans community, we have made a donation to For the Girls to provide rent or gender affirming surgery for black trans people. We are also opening our DMs to any trans author who would like a query or one page critique on an ongoing basis. Thank you, TLA. When you saw that, what did you think? My reaction to that was just, again, panic because they had used my full name and slandered me, right? Like this is just slander. Mm -hmm. And um, they were not being in any way subtle about it. They weren't, I mean, they, they put my my full name, you know what I mean? There's, they're defaming me publicly, very, very publicly. So, um, I mean, I was horrified. I was just like, absolutely devastated. I, 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 I didn't know how far this smear was going to go. And I obviously knew how vitriolic the gender debates were because I was in them, um, just as, a, as an observer. Now, one of my former coworkers, Matt Belford, tweeted, I'd like to apologize for the content that was posted from said account. It's not representative of this agency. My DMs are open. So again, all these open DMs as if that's like literal reparations or something. <laughs> it's literal reparations. And then the funny thing is there were gender critical trans people or just sympathetic trans people. And they were saying, Matt, you, you're ignoring my DMs because they were DMing him, <laughs> but they weren't agreeing with him. They were DMing him saying, why did you fire this woman? Um, so my DMs are open to trans people who agree with me. Yeah. I mean, seriously. So that night... I, this all happened late at night too. I mean, it was around like 8 p.m. in California. So my boss is on New York time and it's, it's later in the East Coast. What so the week was this? Was this on a Sunday weekend? Night. Or like, why? This was on a Sunday night. Not even like, like, you couldn't even just wait until Monday or something. That's crazy to me. Yeah. Um, I know. So did you work in person in an office with them that you would have gone to on Monday? No, it was all online. And this was during okay. the pandemic. This was last August. I see. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, so when this all started happening and I saw the TRAs mobbing me on Twitter, I deleted Twitter off my phone and I didn't want to see any of that stuff. But I did ask my brother to monitor Twitter to make sure that no one was doxing me or making violent threats, just to sort of keep an eye on the situation. And by the next morning, after you know a sleepless night, um, my brother was texting screenshots of people writing supportive messages, and mm -hmm. that was the beginning of you know the well the whole story, but the beginning of things. Uh, looking up a little bit for me. So suddenly people were on my side. They were defending me. And, you know, eventually at some point they started trending. Hashtag I stand with Sasha White. It was kind of insane. It was like the most insane week ever. Um, but obviously all the, the vitriol was still coming in as well. But the um, supportive voices were totally drowning them out and just fighting this battle pretty much on every Twitter thread. Now, I did get a chance to talk to my boss the next morning. He agreed to talk to me on the phone. And it was a short conversation, maybe about 10 minutes. But I asked him, what did I do or say to Merit being fired? I just wanted to hear it from him. You know, I had my pen out. I was taking notes. And he said, OK, let's see. And he opened up my Twitter account. And he read me one tweet that I wrote and I think three tweets that I retweeted. Now, I don't need to read them all, actually, although I've never stated anywhere what the tweets exactly were, except for the one that I wrote, which was about pronouns. And it was basically a critique of they, them pronouns. The other ones that I retweeted, they were things like, um, there is no spectrum of people who can be forcibly impregnated. 
right? When he read that to me, I couldn't help myself. I said, but that's a biological fact. Um, I was trying to not be sassy and I was trying to just listen. And anyway, that, so he finished and he said, you know, this is just a very liberal industry. He kept saying that word liberal. It's very liberal and there's just not room for, for those views. Not at all. Not why would you it's have so free liberal, speech? There's no the room for free speech and civil rights. No, of course not. Okay. Just, or feminism. On. No, oh God forbid. So then I say at the end of the call, I just say, I just want you to remember that you are firing a woman for her feminist views. Long very pause. similar to what I said actually what I was to my boss. When when I heard you say wow. that, yeah, we made very similar statements to our bosses. Yeah. And you know, there was a long pause, and then he just said. I can see why you see it that way. And that was it. Oh, and then this is funny, though. He he said, you know, press are going to try to contact you. I recommend you don't speak with them. Um, someone named Jesse Singal is in my inbox from the New York mag trying to get a comment. But I'm not going to talk to him. And I recommend you don't talk to him either. Now, my boss, Lane, did email Jesse back, which is hilarious. And he told him something that Jesse published the emails. And he told him something about, oh, we had to fire Sasha because she didn't state in her Twitter bio that her views were her own. Okay, that was obvious. I mean, that was, I can tell you that was never, that was never ever said or stated at my job ever. Um, so yeah, okay. Now what, where to go next with that? <laughs> so as all this is happening, you said that you were terrified and you're like really scared, which makes sense. But I'm also curious, what were the specific things that you were scared of were going to happen to you? Yeah. So, you know, you kind of feel in this moment like your life might be ruined. I mean, you know, if if you've ever been um, falsely accused of something, you know how horrible of a feeling that is. You know how sickening that feels when people believe some, this accusation against you. For both of us, it was that we are bigots. That was the false mm -hmm. accusation there. Um, but on the other hand, there was the correct accusation, which is that we are feminists, right? So that was, right. I think, you know, the real the real crime here, if, if we're gonna parse, if we're gonna get into the, to the content, of course. Um, but I was scared that, you know, I knew my career was over in publishing. Just from scrolling through publishing industry Twitter, people were talking about me. It was like people who would have never heard of me before. And they were complaining about me or saying that the agency did good to get rid of a bigot. And um, it was quite clear that I wasn't going to have a career in this industry anymore. So that was incredibly upsetting. But even beyond that, I was worried that no one would hire me, you know, that my name would just be slandered yeah. forever. And this is when they Google you now, this is what they see. Yes. It's all over the internet. Yes, exactly. There's no hiding from it. There's no covering it up or making it disappear. And um, I think I think that was the most terrifying thing was just no, it was just wondering if I was going to be completely destroyed. And, you know, it that has happened to some people. Like I spoke to a woman on my podcast when I, when I was first starting named Tabitha Morris, and she has one of the worst cancellation stories that I've heard. It's very different. She's not um, part of the gender critical movement. She's a conservative, like a hardcore conservative right winger. And um, she made a video talking about how she doesn't support the Black Lives Matter movement. And she was really sassy. And she was like, you can kiss my white ass. And, um, <laughs> and you know, she's like a Southern woman and she has that affect. And, um, but it, there wasn't, it wasn't hateful though. And then she, right. she got, she was the subject of a campaign and they got her fired from her job of 20 years. Um, she wasn't able to get a lawyer because lawyers would literally tell her, you know, we don't want to touch this. Um, we don't support what you've said. It was political. She hasn't been able to get hired anywhere else because everybody knows who she is and she's like a pariah. Um, you know, she, and she didn't go to college. She worked her way up 
in her job over 20 years learning on the job. She worked in a hospital and um, she had achieved a really, a really good salary by, you know, by that time. And she told me like, she, she can't ever hope to have a salary like that again. Um, she has kids. She's received threats of rape towards her daughters. Um, and, and anyway, so, so this is like the type of thing that happens to people. This really happens to people. So that's, that's what I was afraid of. So, you, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the lawyer thing because people have asked me a lot. I assume you've gotten the similar question. Why didn't you sue? Yeah, and, that's uh, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think that like understanding the current, like the crisis mindset that you're in when this happens is actually really helpful for understanding why at least I didn't sue. And I think kind of similar for why you didn't sue. Yes. And for me, it was like, I was going through this whole thing and at the same time there was like all of these other life things that were also happening. Like I had to move uh, across the country and that was a huge stressor. And when I was moving, I was moving to a different state. And so find like the complexities of finding a lawyer and like all that stuff. I, I did call some hotline to like get connected to an employment lawyer and like the, like half hour free consultation that they gave me was like, you're an at will employee. There's nothing you could do. There was not like, you wouldn't have a cause of action here. And they, like, they basically told me that I, like, there's nothing really that you could do in this case anyways. And, um, you know, part of me wishes that I did sue at that point just to make a stink, you know, because these cases tend to like blow up and get more attention. Um, but at the time, I don't know if I could have handled more attention. My case didn't really get the media blowout that yours did. My mental health was really fragile. I was really struggling to not be depressed. I was struggling to, you know, get off the couch at, you know, during the day and like get out into the world. I was, act I was scared. Like I was physically scared of going out of my front door and me too, then, even if that was irrational, you know, I became afraid yeah. in my case because I don't live in a city. Um, but where, you know, where, you know, none of my neighbors are on Twitter. Well, maybe they are, but you know what I mean? I don't live in an urban center yeah. like you did where you were surrounded by other activists and people in the scene, but I did develop a fear of the outside world for a few months afterwards. Yeah. And, and I don't know about what the case is in New York, but in Pennsylvania, we only have a six month statute of limitations on, um, a, civil rights employment case, which is essentially what this would have been. I would have been trying to make the argument that I was fired based on a protected characteristic. And by the time I actually felt like I had passed that immediate crisis moment where my uh, like emotional health was stable enough where I actually could have handled the stress of a lawsuit, that six months had already passed. And um, they got away scot-free because of it without any extra attention or anything besides the limited attention I've been able to bring to them. Um, and I think that's an important thing for people to know about this process is that sometimes like maybe you could sue, maybe you couldn't, depending on what happens. Some cases sound stronger than others, depending on the protections in different areas. But uh, you have to be able to take that case on in the immediate moment, essentially. Like you have to be able to do it right away and be able to handle that either financially, emotionally, et cetera. And it's kind of similar to the question of why people don't report other crimes against them, like sexual assault or something. You know, I never reported a sexual assault that I experienced and or any of the sexual assaults I've experienced. And it, because it's a similar thing where in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, you're like, I don't feel like I can handle this right now. And then by the time it passes, you're like, well, could I even still, if I did, like, what would that mean? I'm living someplace different. Like, it, it gets complicated. Yeah. Yes, absolutely to everything you said. And there's something called outwell employment in the U.S., which means that they can fire you for any reason they want, except for those protected characteristics, which is why that would have been our grounds to sue. Um, and Tabitha Morris, to mention her again, the woman who, who was canceled for um, speaking out against the Black Lives Matter movement, she's now campaigning to end at will employment. And um, I can link to something from her as well. Um, she, so the, the, what would be so good about ending at will employment would be that not only are they not allowed to, 
well, okay, I should say, because they are not allowed to fire you um, for the reasons they fired us, if, if, they, if that was the case, um, then they would not be as susceptible to the mob because they would have some ground, the employer, I'm saying, would have some grounds to just ignore the mob because they can't throw them ahead. They can't, you know, give them the blood that they want. So they would actually have some authority to point to and say, sorry, you know, yeah, we think they're reprehensible, but we have to uh, continue to work with them. But, you know, something like that. So, right. yeah. um, which is actually what Donna Hughes uh, has experienced at the University of Rhode Island because, because as tenure. a publicly funded yeah. university, no, it's because of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. They're a publicly funded university. And so they actually have to protect free speech to like a little bit more of a degree than other places, as long as she doesn't violate X, Y, Z policies, which she didn't. And so they put out a statement condemning her, but ultimately they can't fire her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or they can't be a problem. Right. I want to share something that I'm ashamed of. Um, okay. I, when my boss was hiring me, I, um, it took a lot of back and forth before he did officially hire me. You know, I was his intern and between one of our conversations, he fired one of his authors because the author had been accused of sending inappropriate text messages to women or a woman. There was no evidence prevent, presented of this whatsoever, um, but my boss fired him and denounced him in the same way that he denounced me with a statement on Twitter. That did not blow up. No one came to support that guy Nothing, as far as I know, came to light about it. Um, but when my boss mentioned it, I just said, I'm sure you did the right thing. And I am ashamed of that now, you know, because I knew that was Do you was think that accusation was false? Or do you think I even if no it was true, knowing. it was still wrong? No, I, I think if it was true, that may have been okay to fire him. Yeah. But I could see that I could see what was happening. I could see mm -hmm. that my boss was throwing somebody to the sharks because he was afraid of getting mobbed. And, you know, I don't know what kind of relationship he had with that author. I don't know anything about it. But it was clearly a case of mob justice. And mm -hmm. I just didn't say anything because I wanted this job. I wanted to get hired. And I thought, what does that have to do with me? Right. You're not going to send sexual harassment over text <laughs> to coworkers. So. That's what you think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 I, I, I can see why that would kind of eat at you because you were in the position that, like on the flip side. And then you had to go through what he went through yeah. and maybe he deserved it or not, but like, you don't know. And right. that's the big question. That's the thing. At least with what, at least in your case and also in my case, all of the accusations were really in black and white for people to read for themselves. Yes. And, you know, people were able to read my article and make their own decision. And uh, same with you, people were able to read your tweets and make their own decision about whether or not it was justified. And at least we, although I do think I was like, lied about in the sense that people, uh, you know, said that I was hateful or bigoted or transphobic or um, all these adjectives about, you know, how bad I am as a person. The actual accusation of Mary Kate wrote this article and published it on Medium, like I did do that. <laughs> like I, like I definitely did. <laughs> and there's no denying that. The question is just And it's a great article. Go read it, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, it's a classic 4W. So I definitely recommend it. But then, it's really so good. Sasha, after all of this happens, after like you're, so you're in this moment of fear and, you know, you're starting to get positive messages. Like what is your 
like, what do you do from there? What is it like your next week look like in terms of like, how do you take care of yourself? Are you immediately starting to job hunt? Like how, how are you uh, continue, like, continuing to interact with the world at that point? And what are you seeing for your own future in like that next week or two? Mm -hmm. So I guess I will say, luckily I didn't have all my eggs in one basket from before I got hired when I was still an intern I was planning to go into potentially to go into another career. So I had a lot of plans in place for that. So I just kept working away on that. Um, and I'm lucky enough to live with my parents right now. So I'm sort of safe. I didn't have uh, the looming threat of, you know, being kicked out of somewhere, not being able to pay rent. Um, that was very fortunate. I will say the, so the week that followed Oh man, what a fucking week. I mean, there's this hilarious and amazing article by Toby Young, um, who I have sort of like a strange affinity for, but uh, he wrote this article called The Public Humiliation Diet, and um, or maybe it was The Humiliation Diet, and he talks about how he lost weight when he was canceled. And I mean, yeah, you lose your appetite, you feel sick, you can't sleep, you just, it's, it's horrible. Um, and... I was getting contacted by so many people, you know, so much different press. And there were all these articles coming out about me. The first article that I saw was in the Daily Mail. So it was a bit of a shock. Yeah. Um, and all the way across the pond. Yeah, it was. So mostly I got attention in the UK. It, I actually barely mm -hmm. got any coverage in the US media at all. It's mostly all in the UK, as well as when it was trending on Twitter, that was in the UK. That wasn't in the, trending in the US. Um, as the support start, you know, as the supportive articles were being written, um, the TRAs also ramped up their attacks. And there were these long threads where they would take like everything I ever tweeted and make a thread of look how awful she is, which in my opinion is like, if you need like 30 tweets, then, you know, they're like 30 like mild tweets. So you're trying to like add them all up into something hateful. Um, they were continuing to slander me. Um, and the worst slander that was, uh, they found this tweet that I, that I wrote that was about a pink news article and everybody knows pink news is, is fucking bullshit. So that was the context in the context in which I tweeted. This was like, this was the article going around that day on Twitter. And it was an article about, a, I guess a trans woman had tried to enter a women's bathroom and the woman who was in the bathroom did not want this person to enter, perceived uh, the person correctly as male and ended up karate chopping the trans woman on the arm. Fake uh, pink news is so hyperbolic and so ridiculous. They're like a parody of themselves. So I didn't feel the need to point that out. But when I retweeted it, I wrote, you know, something about how that I was glad that some women still stand their ground. Now, I got absolutely raked through the calls for this. They said that I was condoning violence, that I support. They were claiming that I support trans women being beaten. And um, this really spread, you know, this really spread. So that was so upsetting to me because I thought, you know, this tweet does look bad. This tweet does make me look bad. And, um, you know, I just, I didn't know how to address that. I actually, I, I did a podcast with Upper Hand Mars and I went on his channel and we went, we talked about that tweet and everything. So I feel like if people want an explanation, they should watch that video. And it was pretty funny because he told me that he had a similar tweet that he was dragged the coals for, where he said, basically, if you still look like a man, don't expect to be welcomed into the women's restroom. And they tried to cancel him for that tweet as well, because we're pointing out the bottom line, which is that trans women are men. And everything hinges on that like all of their arguments hinge on that trans women are women and all of our arguments hinge on the truth which is that they're men so that's why our arguments are valid and theirs aren't because if trans women were women then it would be wrong to deny them to enter women's spaces so i was just 
trying to keep my head above water. I was just trying right. to survive, basically, just trying to like so like, what sorts of things were you... sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So like, what, what sorts of things were you doing to try to survive? So you mentioned you had your brother take over managing your social media, which is really smart, a very good solution there. And I feel like if anyone has someone they trust to do that in their lives in a moment of crisis, even if it's not a cancellation, like even if you're just getting a bunch of like drama and bites and stuff, like have someone else babysit it for you if necessary. That's a really good suggestion. Like what other things were you actually doing to try to get through? Well, just rely on your support system if you have them. That's what I did. I just relied on my family. And um, if, if I didn't have my immediate family supporting me, oh my God, I don't know what I would have done. And I mean, I'm lucky that it was only ever online. You know what I mean? And I know you've experienced real life assaults for this. And, um, but that's the, that was the way that I got through it was to lean on my family for support. And it was pretty devastating that there were members of my fa extended family who thought that I did do something wrong. So, um, wow. yeah. And my friends as well. I leaned on my friends who were really supportive too. And um, that's what I needed just, to, you know, like the second I got fired, I sent my best friends screenshots of the emails from my boss so they would see what was going on and um, just keep them looped in. Like, don't push people out. That's the worst thing you could do. The people who support you push out the voices of the people who are telling you yeah. that you're a bigot. But um, how about you, MK? Yeah, so I had like a mix of good and bad coping mechanisms. Um, I have struggled throughout my life with uh, using alcohol when I'm really anxious to essentially self medicate. And, you know, I've, no I've always had anxiety at just like, generalized anxiety. And I never wanted to take any medication for it because usually day to day I can manage it just through, you know, like my uh, techniques that I learned through therapy and stuff. Um, but when this went down, I started drinking more than I should. Actually, I would like wake up in the morning and my anxiety was so bad that I would start drinking. Um, like not first thing necessarily, but pretty early on in the day, like it was not okay. And I started to get so anxious around little things like uh, the doorbell chiming or my phone going off or getting an email. So there, there was a period of like three days where pretty much every email I got was related to this. It was, you are uh, canceled from this thing, you're fired from that thing, you're deplatformed from that conference. And it was just like a serious, or it was someone like reaching out about it in some way. And even the supportive emails I appreciate them certainly, um, but they also felt stressful because every email was about it. And so I started to like, like little things that like you should be able to do, like check your email, check your phone and your texts and uh, answer your door. Like I was scared to do all of those things and I really hold up and um, I'm lucky I have a very supportive partner who kind of like nursed me through it um, and helped me. So like, there, he encouraged me to play a video game. And so we were playing uh, what was it, like Super Mario or something. <laughs> and we just like binged this video game for like a week or two while I was uh, just like not okay. And then I started trying to reach out more to some of my friends who were still supportive of me. And I'm super grateful for those people in my life. Um, they really got me through that time. And there was a, one friend in particular who has really shown herself to be a whatever the opposite of a fair weather friend is, like a stormy weather friend. Like she's the friend to, even if you don't talk for like six months, when shit goes down, like she is there and ready to help you. And so I'm super grateful to her in particular. And uh, she let us come stay with her at her uh, place, which is like in the Philly suburbs for a few days when we like really needed to get out of town to feel safe. Um, and then really what started to, pull me out of that immediate crisis mode was uh, my partner, Alex, suggesting that we start Spinster. And because up until that, like, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I like you, I was like, I'm never going to work again because my two things I had done in my whole life uh, professionally 
where I work as a software engineer most recently. But before that, I was a women's rights activist working at like women's rights nonprofits like the YWCA and, um, and Cleary Center and places like that. And so I was canceled from both of those now and canceled in animal rights. And so I had been like canceled in all of the things I had any skills in and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I was thinking maybe I'll write more. And I, you know, was starting to write a book. I'm still working on that. Sorry to everyone who I told it was going to happen like three years ago now. Um, but, you know, I started writing more, leaning into that. Um, but I really didn't know what to do. And then having something to actually do a project to work on, you know, having a new idea and a project is always what inspires me. And so uh, I really didn't feel up to starting Spinster at the time. But Alex was like, I'm going to start this. And if you want to help, that would be awesome. And it was his way of kind of like seeing that he, I needed to be pulled out of this depression with something exciting. And so that's what we did. We started Spinster. And uh, then it just, and it blew up. Like the community was so receptive to it so quickly. Um, it was really overwhelming because this was only like, we started in September and I was fired, I think, in August or July, something like that. And so it was, you know, a couple month gap. And in that couple of months of getting Spinster ready and then the launch and then the huge reception to the launch. And then when we launched it, we were getting attacked by all these trans activists and like little script kitties online and everyone trying to hack Spinster and stuff. And so then I couldn't even think about the cancellation, all the friends I lost, all that, because we were doing like 14 hour days trying to keep spinster online and like responding and at that time like we didn't even have good moderation tools we didn't have mods yet it was just me doing all the moderating and uh i'm so grateful now for the mods. shout out spinster mods if any of you are listening um that make me not have to do that work anymore <laughs> um but but having that project is what ultimately pulled me out of my you know kind of drinking too much, depression on the couch, like feeling like I didn't have a future, you know? Um, and so I maybe not everyone uh, functions this way, but for me having like a real thing to do, it, and for some people, you know, maybe it's like you have a like arts and crafts that you like to do, or maybe you have like DIY projects around the house that you like to do, but like throwing yourself head first into something new and exciting for you that also has the opportunity to maybe like open up doors for you. And ultimately that's what happened with Spinster is I, established a reputation among radical feminists because of Spinster, which helped me promote 4W, where, you know, I now do the writing, which helped me uh, get gigs and jobs, which helped me um, kind of establish myself as like a, this, you know, personality, I guess, or uh, uh, in radical feminism and gender critical community. And that was all because I was just super depressed and playing Mario and drinking on the couch. And my partner was like, you need to get out of this like yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I started doing my interviews, you know, I had it set up because a few months prior I had the idea with my dad who is, you know, runs Plebity with me um, to do interviews, to do long form interviews. That was before I knew that like everybody and their mother does long form interviews podcasts now. Um, so we were like, yeah, this is so innovative. Um, but I had done like a few of them. And so I decided to just throw myself into doing more of those to talk to really intelligent, gender critical people who could make the case way better than me at that time of why, you know, I had even been putting myself on the line for this. So um, throwing myself into plebity was everything for me. That's what I'm still doing. Exactly. Like what you said, MK, that's why I'm, you know, on your screen right now, because I just decided to go for it. So yeah, so throwing myself into plebity completely saved me. And um, that I think starts to bring us into uh, the portion of the story where we rise from the ashes like the phoenix after being immolated. <laughs> Yeah. So next week, we're going to get a little bit more into the logistics of building up after you have to start from scratch and completely start over after a cancellation. So if you want to hear that side of the story, then definitely be sure to join us next week because we're going to really get into the behind the scenes of how Plebity 4W uh, all came to be. And I think it will be a bit more hopeful and hopefully uplifting and we can make fun of this whole entire situation and process. So see you next week. <laughs>